Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of ministry. Lord, you could have chosen angels to do this work, but you choose us, frail, mortal human beings, that we might share in the joy of seeing souls won for Christ and also develop a character like you. So bless us, this pray, we pray, this afternoon as we spend a few moments reflecting on heavenly themes. Lord, you know that my feet are made of clay. I'm a weak vessel, and we pray that you would take this, this feeble instrument and for your glory, your Holy Spirit may convict and convert our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I had the uh, privilege last year of going to uh, England, and I wanted to show you a, a slide presentation here of it, but we'll just see if we can go, if we can get this going here. Can someone help me out here? And uh, is it coming on the screen? No? It's there? It was there. Let me try it again. Oh, there it is. Okay, there it's there. So this is uh, last year in England, and uh, I'll pause it for a minute there. We, I, I was asked to speak for a weekend in England, and Adam Ramden said, look, let's go to Oxford. And so we went to Oxford University, and he was showing me where John Wesley preached and where Whitfield preached, and we went to a particular place to try to get into John Wesley's room. And the person wasn't going to let us in initially, and he said, are you Methodist? And Adam Randa is so quick on his feet. He said, we are the sons of Methodism. <laughs> and, uh, amen, uh, so quick. He said, we are the sons of Methodism. And the guy said, oh, really? He said, yeah. And he said, hold on. So he got the keys, and uh, he, he opened the door, and he led us in his room, in John Wesley's room, and he said, hurry up before I get shot, you know, in his British accent. And so, and so this is it. We, we got to go into this room. He opens it up. We go in there. And this is where, this is where Methodism began on a university campus, and the, the Holy Club. And uh, I asked Adam, I said, have you ever been in this room? He said, no, he had never been in that room before. And it felt to be like such a privilege to have been in the room of John Wesley where a great revival broke out in England. I mean, it's just remarkable, remarkable. And uh, we only got to spend a few moments in there, and he, he created this, this short video for, for the Lineage series. And John Wesley, remarkable man, and as one historian put it, Wesley wore plain clothes, preached 40,000 sermons during his lifetime, traveled 250,000 miles on horseback preaching, he married at 48. He worked with 15 different languages. At the age of 83, he was angry because his doctor wouldn't let him preach more than 14 times a week. And at the age of 86, written in his journal are these words, laziness is slowly creeping in. There's an increasing tendency to stay in bed after 5.30 in the morning. Ah, what a rebuke, huh? 83, you think he'd have some license to sleep in? John Wesley's mother said, raised two spiritual giants, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. And this is what she said. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things, whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. What a man. John Wesley changed England. And there's a book I have in my library called England Before and After Wesley, and the thesis is in the title, England Before Wesley and After Wesley. Uh, Berkeley, in his discourse to the magistrates and men in authority, wrote that Britain had collapsed to a degree that had never before known in any Christian country. You're talking about just, just depravity in England. And John Wesley, on a university campus, sparks a revival that changes England, changes England. This is, this is what the historians say. England was revived, prisons were abolished, 
Prisons were reformed, slavery was abolished, Christian ethics were reestablished into society, and industrial England was emancipated. It seems there wasn't a segment of society that was not touched by the influence of John Wesley. One man, by the grace of God. And this is what Ellen White says in the book Great Controversy, page 264. At the close of Wesley's long life, of a more than fourscore years, above half a century spent in itinerant ministry, his avowed adherents numbered more than one half a million souls. But the multitude that through his labors have been lifted from the ruin and degradation of sin to a higher and a purer life, and the number who by his teaching have attained to a deeper and richer experience will never be known till the whole family of the redeemed shall be gathered into the kingdom of God. Do you want your life to make an impact? I used to have a golden retriever, two of them. Uh, I loved my dogs. But I thought to myself, what's the difference between me and my dog? A lot, I pray, right? But one of them is like, look, purpose. Right? Purpose. We want to live for something so that if the Lord Jesus doesn't come, that dash between our birthday and our day of death, we live for something. Amen? And the question is, not everyone lives a life like John Wesley to make this type of impact. And the question is, how? Right? You want your life to count for something, to make an impact? How? This is a big part of it. For those of you that are in my classes, I've been stressing private victory, your evening routine, a morning routine, amen? Look at this. John Wesley would rise up at 4 a.m. every day to seek God for the first four hours of the day. In his later years, Wesley was known to spend up to eight hours a day in prayer. And you can go to John Wesley's house today in England, and there's a prayer room. There's a prayer room. Here's my thesis. Every revival is linked to a radical prayer life. Every single revival. If we want TCI, now TCI is already making an impact, amen, by the grace of God. But if we want it to have a quantitative impact, global impact, it's the Lord Jesus that can do that. Now look at this. Every revival is linked to a radical prayer life. Here it is. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, the greatest revival in history. Now in the morning, having risen a, a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. In the original, this is the first watch. And, and scholars believe this is the hours between 3 to 4 a.m. Jesus got up early to pray. The very next verse says that he was casting out demons and performing miracles. The very next verse. In other words, there's a relationship between his private life and his public victory. Now, look, I'm going to be real with you. I don't know what it is about our generation, but we seem to be okay with a dichotomy between our public life and our private life. I've counseled with the young people that have been very vulnerable with me and authentic, a theology major in particular, not here, no one here knows him, sat in my office one day after preaching a powerful sermon over the weekend. And he sat in my office and he said, look, prior to that sermon, I was binging on pornography. He says, I need help. This thing is destroying my life and I need help. And yet he can get up unabashedly and preach that type of sermon. And I said, brother, like, wh what, what enters your consciousness? That, that the dichotomy between what you did on Sabbath morning and what you were doing just the night before is like night and day. And friends, God is calling us for a life of integrity. Amen? Now, look, 
It doesn't mean we don't struggle, but we need to take these things to Jesus. Amen? And say, Lord, I love this sin. Help me to hate it. Take them to the Lord so that there's not a dissonance between what we do on the platform and what we're doing in our closets. The Bible says, but Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness to pray. So every revival is linked with a radical prayer life. You can see this all the way throughout history. This, this theme that emerges, I'm just going to go through a quick example of each one of them. This is from the book Great Controversy, the Reformation. From the secret place of prayer came the power that shook the world in the Great Reformation. Luther did not fail to devote three hours each day to prayer, and these were taken from that portion of the day most favorable to study. The Reformation changed the world, and Ellen White links it to a man on his knees. Now, here's the thing. God's not up there with a timer saying, okay, I think you've fulfilled your quota. I think I'm going to act. Okay? We're not talking about righteousness by time here. But here's the reality. There's something inherent about prayer that, that causes us to sense our need. Look, why, why pray if we have all the answers, right? But the very posture of prayer indicates that we need help. In other words, it, it changes me. It changes me so that God can entrust us with power. He's not going to give power to individuals that are full of self. And so part of this process of perseverance is to break us down to the place where we recognize we're nothing and we're but dust. And then he says, now I can use you. Now all power is given me in heaven and on earth. Now go. That's the reality. And so here's a man that is on his knees being transformed by the grace of God to feel his nothingness so that when the Reformation comes, he can give all the glory to God. Sun stands still. Remember that? Look at this. Patriarchs and prophets. The man who commanded, son, stand thou still. Can you imagine? You're in the middle of battle, and you have the audacity and the temerity to say, son, stand still. He said, the man who said, stand still, upon Gibeon is the man who for hours lay prostrate upon the earth in prayer in the camp of Gilgal. And Ellen White says this, the men of prayer are the men of what? Are the men of power. Michael Green in his book, 30 Years That Changed the World, says this, three crucial decades in world history. That's all it took. In the years between AD 33 and AD 64, a new movement was born. In those 30 years, it got sufficient growth and credibility to become the largest religion the world has ever known and to change the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It has spread into every corner of the globe and has more than two billion adherents. It has left an indelible impact on civilization, on culture, on education, on medicine, on freedom, and of course, the lives of countless of people worldwide. And the seedbed for all this, the time when it took decisive root, was in these three decades. It all began with a dozen men and a handful of women, and then the Spirit came. No budget, no education, no resources, peasants in the upper room pleading for the Holy Spirit, and they took the gospel to the world in one generation. We have more education, more resources, more ability than those people ever dreamed of having. Ian Bound says this, God shapes the world by prayer. Prayer is God's singular condition to move ahead in his son king, son's kingdom. Therefore, the believer who's the most highly skilled in prayer will do the most for God. And the secret of success in Christ's kingdom is the ability to pray. And Ellen White says, by your fervent prayers of faith, you can move the arm that moves the world. I, I named my son Hudson after Hudson Taylor. Uh, his middle name is Michael, and because I wanted his initials to be HMS. 
No pressure. No pressure. In his book, his son wrote a book on Hudson Taylor. And there's a third person account of being at a prayer meeting where Hudson Taylor was at. And this is the third person account. Mr. Taylor opened the meeting by leading out in a hymn. His appearance did not impress me. He was slightly built and spoke in a quiet voice. But when he said, let us pray, and proceeded to lead the meeting in prayer, my ideas underwent a change. I never heard anyone pray like that. There was a simplicity, a tenderness, a boldness, a power that hushed and subdued me and made it clear that God had admitted him to the inner circle of his friendship. Such praying was evidently the outcome of long tearing in the secret place and was as the dew from the Lord. To hear Mr. Taylor plead for China was to know something of what it meant by the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. The meeting lasted from four to six o'clock, but it seemed one of the shortest prayer meetings I've ever attended. And the person said, the only person that he heard pray like that was Charles Spurgeon. Hudson Taylor, 1865. Hudson Taylor founded the China Inland Mission. The organization would have no guaranteed salary, nor would they solicit funds except from God. People thought he was crazy. By 1876, 52 missionaries joined the China Inland Mission. From 18, in 1887, there were 102 missionaries. In 1900, when Hudson Taylor retired, there were 750 missionaries. The mission continued on, and by 1932, the number of missionaries grew to 1,285. From 1865 to 1900, Hudson Taylor had asked God alone for funds and received a total of $4 million. And that's $4 million in the 1800s. Thousands were led to Christ as a result. And I pray that from Weimar University, Hudson Taylor's. Amen? Yeah. J.N. Andrews, to have a vision for the impossible. That's what God is calling for. Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman said this, revivals are born in prayer. When Wesley prayed, England was revived. When Knox prayed, Scotland was refreshed. When the Sunday school teachers of Tannenbrook prayed, 11,000 young people were added to the church in a year. Whole nights of prayer have always been succeeded by whole days of soul winning. It was my junior year of college, uh, it was 19, man, I'm dating myself, 1997, believe it. Junior year in college, I took the summer off to be a Bible worker in South Central LA. And Watts. That summer, no mail out, 20 Bible workers, on the streets, and we pitched a tent on Florence and Figueroa. It's called Prostitution Lane. I remember back then you had to use pay phones because we didn't have cell phones. I was, on this, I was on the phone with my parents on a pay phone, and five feet from me was, was a prostitute that was soliciting on that corner. I mean, it was crazy. Never, never imagined it. And so we're, we're on the streets going door to door, and it was very simple. We knock on the door, we became like the mailman. We were given a map and we'd grid it out. We'd grid it out and we were instructed to go to those homes and pray with every person in that territory that was ours. Pray with every single person. If they were not home, we marked not home. You know, if there was a big dog, we put big dog. You know, whatever it was. We, we, went, we went through this thing and, uh, and went through. So in the beginning, we just went to these homes and said, Hello, my name is David. I'm with this ministry, and we believe in the power of prayer. Well, do you have a prayer request? And they say, sure. I mean, it was amazing. We got all these prayer requests, notebook paper, just filled up with these prayer requests. And we'd go back. Now, this is descriptive, not prescriptive. But in this particular series of meetings, the 20 Bible workers, we'd come back. Man, it was crazy. Every other night for 11 weeks, we'd pray all night for every single one of those contacts. Descriptive, not prescriptive, but I'm just telling you what happened. 
okay? And then once a week, we would fast. I mean, this was like... But the thing was, after spending a night in prayer and we'd walk in on the streets of Watts and people were getting high on the street corner from heroin, whatever it was, I mean, it was crazy. And we went to a funeral of a person that got shot. I mean, it, it was... And I'm an Asian walking around after the Rodney King riots where they burned down all these Korean stores. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm like, but, but I knew at, uh, on those streets in South Central L.A., if I died, I was ready to go. You know what I'm talking about? Because I just spent the entire night in prayer for these souls. It's like th that summer, I saw demon-possessed people come into that tent. I mean, it's, it was the great controversy before my very eyes. That summer, I mean, I saw miracles. I saw miracles, and all glory goes to God. It was, it was the power of prayer. This is the power of prayer. There were 700 to 1,000 people coming to those meetings. No mail out. In the heart of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I saw people. I mean, this changed my life. I was the first contact. You know what I'm talking about? From, hello, let me pray with you to Bible studies, to the meetings, to baptism. That summer. That summer. And I remember standing by the baptistry as, as the person that the Lord had used me to reach them. I mean, I was crying. I was weeping my heart out as I saw them go down to the water to the grave and come out with the other side. And I said, Lord, I, I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I said, I'm yours. I want to do this for the rest of my life. There's something that Jesus says we should ask for six times. You know this. Ask, be given to you. Knock and you will find. Parents more willing to give good gifts to their children. That whole analogy. But at the end, he says, to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Ellen White says the Holy Spirit brings all the other blessings in its train. In the original, it actually says, keep on asking. Keep on asking. Now, Ellen White makes an interesting comment. God does not say, ask once and you shall receive. He bids us ask, unwearingly persistent prayer. The persistent asking brings the petitioner into a more earnest attitude and gives him an increased desire to receive the things for which he asks. And Evan Roberts, in the late 1800s, began to pray for a revival in Wales. He prayed for 13 years. At the age of 13, having a burden, prayed for 13 years. And this is what happened in 1904. At the age of 26, he began to preach. 17 people gave their hearts to Jesus. 70,000, this is true, you can look it up, people were converted in two months. 85,000 in five months. 100,000 in six months. It is known as the Great Revival of 1904, and there was a real revival. Taverns were closed for lack of business, and crime plummeted. Do you want to see this? I mean, can you imagine this in Sacramento? It can happen. And Ellen White says, a revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. We need to ask for it. We need to sacrifice for it and ask for it. And here it is. It was, there was a time when Jesus would spend the entire night in prayer. And E.M. Bounds says this, there was a time when we gave whole nights to chambering and wantonness, to dancing and the world's reverie. We did not tire then. We were chiding the sun that rose so soon and wishing the hours would lad a while that we might delight in wilder merriment and perhaps deeper sin. Oh, why do we weary in heavenly employments? Why do we grow weary when asked to watch with our Lord? You ever pull an all-nighter before parting? Come on now. And yet when we come to Christ, someone asks us to pray a little long, it's like, oh, that's legalism. I can't do that. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. Now, we, we're not talking about being on the timer here, but prayer is talking to God as to a friend. You know, when I was dating my wife, she wasn't my wife then, I spent hours on the phone. I wasn't on the clock. 
I wanted to talk to her every moment. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? And we got the script all wrong. When we're a pagan, we party all night. When someone asks us for a protracted prayer meeting, I'm saved by grace. And sometimes I feel like righteousness by faith is an excuse for spiritual laziness. Joe Kidder says this, we do not need more formulas. We need more filling. We do not need more plans. We need more power. We do not need more strategies. We need more spirit. I'm not saying we don't plan, but I think you get the point. A.W. Tozer says this, if the Holy Spirit were withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. So here we are. I got to the university church. This was 2007. Got there in 2008. The bottom fell out of the U.S. economy in Michigan. I was brand new as a pastor there. Church budget started bleeding. We had to cut all programs. Housing market in crisis, some of you remember this. The auto industry bailout, I mean, it was chaos. People are losing their jobs, and I thought on my watch that church would close. It was right there in the Rust Belt in East Lansing, right across the street from Michigan State University. And so I was at a prayer meeting, typical Adventist prayer meeting, like seven people in a church of 200. And typical Adventist prayer meeting like, you don't pray, you study, right? So we're there. Good pastor, I'm leading out in this prayer meeting, and the church members are like, Pastor, this isn't prayer meeting. This is Bible study, and with all due respect, we need to pray. And I said, okay. Uh, they said, we need to pray sacrificially. And I said, you said sacrificially, right? They said, absolutely. I said, well, I'll tell you what. This next Sunday, I'll be at the church at 4 a.m. I'll see you there. Their eyes were like. And I thought, being my cynical self, I'd show up, have a nice prayer meeting by myself, and then see him the next Wednesday night and say, where were you guys, right? And so I show up, 4 a.m., East Lansing Church. Now, if you're going to show up at 4, I got to get up minimum at 3, right? And being a pastor, sometimes Saturday nights to go, to go late. So I get up, 3 a.m., rush off to the church, turn on the lights, open the door, settle down to pray, fully expecting to pray by myself. A couple of minutes later, the door opens, and un uh, in comes in a bunch of, like, disheveled, bloodshot eyes, hair all messed up. I'm like, I've never seen people like this. You know, they all come in, they file in and sit down. About six or seven of them, they said, all right, pastor, let's go. I was like, all right, let's go. So we started praying for the Holy Spirit and revival, praying for this family and the church to come back. You know, we're praying for a revival, a primitive godliness that hasn't been seen since apostolic times. We're pouring our hearts out to God. And so we, we began this prayer meeting in 2008, middle of the crisis, and, uh, and we, we kept it at 4 a.m. for about six months, believe it or not, for about six months. And then they decided to move it to 7, okay? So then we moved it to 7. And for my almost my entire tenure from that time, for about, I stayed in that church almost eight years, seven years, that prayer meeting group met consistently at 4 a.m. But then something started happening. You, you know what prayer is? An integral part of prayer is, is authorization. Permission. You know, there's rules in the great controversy. In, in other words, God will go so far and no further because he doesn't have authorization. He doesn't have the papers. So in the Bible, it says that when the paralytic was let down, Jesus saw their faith. Look it up, plural. 
In other words, it wasn't just the faith of the paralytic. It was the faith of his friends, too. So, so that was authorization. So, so when you pray, and when a group of people come down together to pray, God's like, I got the papers. Gabriel, go. You know what I'm talking about? Go. And when Gabriel goes and he starts molding circumstances and events in your family's life to move above and beyond that he's not able, and Satan's like, wait, 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 wait. He didn't ask for this. Like, what are you doing? Gabriel's like, step back. We got the papers. Because he didn't ask for this, but his mom just did. Step aside. So, like, look, this is, this is, this is what prayer does. It gives God permission, authorization to move above and beyond. And look, don't you want to give God full authorization? I mean, he's working right now with his hands tied because there's ground rules in this warfare. Consent is the most powerful thing that you can give God. And even though secondary consent is not as powerful as primary, secondary consent still counts. It's called intercessory prayer. And that's what all of us can do for every single contact that we're going to meet this semester by the grace of God. And so miracles started happening. People's lives were being changed in our own campus uh, among our students. And one person by the name of Carlo Dorve, he's a trumpeter. Maybe you've seen him at GYC. He has one arm. He's from Haiti. And Carlo Dorve got on fire. We sent him off to Emmanuel Missionary Institute, and he, and he started to to get on fire for God, and he, and he got this business card that he'd carry with him. It said, free Bible studies, answers to life's most difficult questions, and he kept them. So, so we mentored and trained him, and so he was on the street corner. He was on the street corner and getting ready to go on a bus, and he meets this young lady, Lou. She's an atheist from China. At Michigan State University, we had 3,000 international students, 2,000 of which were from China. And I told our university church, I said, look, the mission field comes to us every single year right across the street. They come to us. It's our responsibility to reach them. And so he's standing there. He sees Lu Yang. She has a catechism in her hand because she's searching, an atheist that's searching. And Carlo's like, hey, you want to study the Bible? Here's my business card. She emails him back. She starts coming to church. We give her a key to the church so she can study in the basement of our church for her finals. I was at Potluck, and my associate pastor was a soul winner. He came to me and said, David, like, and I could tell by the look in his eyes, like, we need to go. So I'm like, I said, all right. He said, we need to go. So I step into his office. Lu Yang is sitting there. I could see in the corner of her eye a tear coming down. And I said, man, this is, this is conviction. So I sat down, and I said, Lou, what's going on? And she told me. And I said, do you sense the Holy Spirit moving in your life? I said, do you want to kneel down right now and give your heart to Jesus Christ? And she said, yes. And we knelt down, said the sinner's prayer, and this atheist accepted Christ. Two weeks later, we were baptized and went to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She came to this country as an atheist. She left as an Adventist. We met another young man, Anthony Burrell, gentleman in the red shirt. He was in the music department. By this time, Carlo Dorve was on fire. He's like, I'm going to convert this whole music department. He meets Anthony, son of a Baptist preacher, and he asks him, do you want to stu study Bible prophecy? And Anthony's like, oh, yeah. And Anthony tells us later in his testimony, he said, man, I was going to teach this brother a thing or two. So he sits down, and Carlo Dove gives him a study on Daniel 2. Daniel 2. Anthony's like blown away. He says, he says, Carlo, you're a Bible scholar, man. <laughs> and uh, he says, you're a Bible scholar. And Carlo says, you haven't seen nothing yet. He starts coming to church. He gets convicted on the Sabbath. He's convicted on the Sabbath. But he's scared because his dad. So he calls his dad. Can you imagine? He says, Dad, I'm about to join the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he's fearing that he's going to be disowned. And his dad says, look, if there's anything I want for your life, 
I want you to follow your convictions. He gets baptized. The issue, he's a rising star, a jazz musician. He's headed somewhere. We didn't talk to him about music yet. The Holy Spirit did. He comes in my office. He says, I can't do this. I can't do this. He says, there's a problem. I have a free ride at Michigan State University, full scholarship on a ja in the jazz program. And he said, if I walk away from this, I'm homeless. I lose everything. I feel responsible. I said, brother, uh, you follow where the Lord's leading you, wherever that may be. Pray with him. He goes over to the missions office, drops out of the program. He's homeless. I appeal to the church. They take him in. We put him up. We sponsor him to a training program, hire him as a Bible worker. He goes off to college. He's a Seventh-day Adventist minister in the Pacific Northwest today. All glory goes to God. I didn't even know what I was doing but I knew where to go. The finances in that church turned around to the place where every year we ended the church budget in a surplus. $40,000 surplus almost every year. In addition to that, locally hired, we, full, we hired a full-time associate pastor, a Bible worker, and a media evangelist to do web ministry, three full-time and still a surplus. The Lord puts his money where his mouth is. And look, guys, some, some of you may wonder, why is it every week we got to do this? Well, look, the only thing you can take to heaven is your character and souls. You can't take your degree. I'm not saying don't finish. But you know what I'm talking about. In other words, this is the only thing. This is the only thing. And look, one day, by the grace of God, when we get to heaven, just perhaps by the grace of God, someone's going to stop you in the New Jerusalem and say, you know, thank you for taking those Wednesdays at TCI. Because of that, I'm here. And then a billion years later, they're going to stop you again. Thank you for stopping at TCI. A trillion years later. In other words, it's the return that never stops. And that's why God wants us to have a share in his kingdom. Because at the second coming of Jesus, our net assets go to zero. The reality is, every Wednesday, we have an opportunity to move God's kingdom forward and ensure that at the second coming, someone's going to be there with us. I want to close with this quote from Charles Finney. Let's skip through these here. Charles Finney says this. Early Advent preacher, and I have this in my court book. Immediately, I found myself imbued with such a power from on high that a few words dropped here and there to individuals were the means of their immediate conversion. My words seemed to fasten like barbed arrows in the souls of men. They cut like a sword. They broke the heart like a hammer. Multitudes can attest to this. He talks about an experience where he would just say a few words and his, and his words were like hooks upon the heart and people were being converted. Then he contrasts this. Sometimes I would find myself empty of this power. I would go and visit and find that I made no saving impression. I would then set apart a day for private fasting and prayer. After humbling myself and crying out for help, the power would return upon me with all of its fullness. This has been the experience of my life. In other words, look, at TCI, when we go out there next Wednesday, let's make sure that we're covered by the blood. You know what I'm talking about? Don't you want an experience where God can use you? 
Amen? Look, I'm tired of mediocre. I'm tired of average. I'm tired of just getting by. Let's see the book of Acts. And this can be the Oxford University of Adventism by the grace of God. Amen? Do you believe that? I mean, you're not here by accident. Out of all the places you could have gone, you're here right now. God has a plan for your life. Let his vision be fulfilled. But we need to be willing to be made willing. Is that your desire here today? And so I want to make an appeal. I want to make a specific appeal this afternoon. If there's something in your life that you need to lay on the altar and the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, it's today. The time is now. Because we need to go out there with our armor on and results like Charles Finney by the grace of God. And so, if you feel the Holy Spirit saying, Lord, it's the Holy Spirit saying, look, there's something in my life I've been wrestling with, I've been struggling with, and it's okay to struggle. We need to lay it on the altar. Give me the desire to desire. And if that's your desire this afternoon, I want to invite you to come forward for special prayer. This is between you and God. Who cares what other people think? This is your salvation on the line. I want to invite you to come forward for special prayer. I'm coming forward. If there's something in your life that you want to lay on the altar and you say, Lord, I want to be covered by the blood, and you want to say, Lord, I'm willing to be made willing. Give me the gift of repentance this afternoon. And you want to say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm tired of playing games. I want to lay it all on the altar this afternoon and say, Lord, give me the gift of surrender. Use me is my humble plea. Can we kneel? Can we do that? Let's kneel. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, first of all, thank you for your mercy upon us, but because if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd be lost. We're only here by your grace. And Lord, we come forward this afternoon in acknowledgement of our brokenness and our humanity, in acknowledgement that we need help. And yet that's the most helpless yet most invincible place that we could ever be. And so, Lord, we come. Help us to be willing to be made willing. We're tired of playing games. We're hearing the footsteps of an approaching God. And this afternoon, we've come forward saying, Lord, I'm laying it all on the altar. Give me the gift of repentance. I can't even give my heart, but take it. Our coming forward is an acknowledgement of our humanity and our spiritual weakness, Lord but you've asked us to come. And so, Lord, we've come forward saying, please use us for your glory. Help us not to get in the way. May this semester's TCI be the beginning of a revival and reformation in our own hearts and in this community that is unprecedented for your glory. But first, you need to break us down so that you can use us. And so, Lord, help us to get the skeletons out of our closet our addictions, Lord, empower us. If we fall, help us to get back up. But help us to claim the God that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy. Help us by your grace. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.